Thanks, everyone, for coming to listen to me speak today. So my background, as Herb said, is my degrees are all in aerospace engineering. So my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD. Um, and my specialty is actually in electromagnetic propulsion systems. So that actually is uh, rocket science for spacecraft as they travel through the universe, as well as they can travel on the ground, which is going to be the emphasis of my talk today. Um, but one of the things that's very interesting about being an engineer is that you learn about the core sciences, and specifically about physics and mathematics. And engineering is the application of physics and mathematics to create new technologies, hopefully to make the world a better place. And so for many years, um, I worked for NASA, for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is kind of the home of all of the interplanetary space exploration missions. And one of my most um, interesting projects was working on the Curiosity rover. Have anyone heard of it by a show of hands? It landed on the surface of Mars in 2012, and my role in that mission was on the entry to set landing team Team to help land the rover safely on the surface of the planet. And um, I was really proud to have been able to be a part of that and being able to put myself on another planet is super exciting. But then I started to realize that my engineering skills um, were really important to help society and I wanted to have a way to bring it a little bit closer to home. So my next project was actually to put something on the International Space Station, so in low Earth orbit, um, a mission called the Cold Atom Laboratory, which is about exploring the fundamental physics of matter itself. So most people are familiar that light is both a particle and a wave, but it turns out that all matter is also exhibits particle and wave-like nature. And as part of that mission, um, we're trying to understand the nature of how complexity arises in the universe um, from a fundamental physics perspective in terms of the way atoms behave, the way electrons behave and photons behave, but eventually to understand the way our solar system works and how the sun and the moon and the earth interact around each other because everything actually can be described by fundamental physics. But nevertheless, I wanted to do something even closer to home, and so I decided to finally leave um, NASA and go and work in private industry, specifically on the development of the Hyperloop. And the Hyperloop is a new mode of transportation which can best be described actually as a spacecraft traveling on the ground. And the reason why that's important is because with the advent of new technologies, if we can do something here at home to take these space age techniques and these space age technologies to have more efficient and green transportation, we can actually solve one of the biggest problems that we have as a society, which is climate change, by reducing the amount of CO2 emissions that we have from the various sectors of our economy. So, what I first like to talk about is the Hyperloop. Um, is it science fiction? So any of you who have watched any of the cartoons from the 1950s, 1960s, remember George Jetson flying through a tube between buildings? And that was the first um, sort of suggestion of what a Hyperloop could be in terms of high-speed transportation for a smaller number of people, in the case, one person here. And there's also been a lot of talk about it in um, science fiction media for the past 20, 30 years. But it was only in 2013 when Elon Musk, who's famous for SpaceX, actually brought up the concept once again as an alternative to high-speed transportation in California. And so high-speed transportation can take many forms. It can be an aircraft, it can be a high-speed train, or it can be a magnetically levitating passenger transport system that operates in a vacuum tube, which is the Hyperloop. And so to talk a little bit more about it, I've got a video which describes the technology that we're developing back in Los Angeles. This is Hyperloop, a new mode of transportation that has been developed by Hyperloop One. It starts with an electric motor, which is broken up into two basic components, the rotor, which rotates, and the stator, which is stationary. The stator is an electromagnet, so when an electric current passes through it, the rotor is magnetically attracted to spin. Unlike a normal electric motor, the Hyperloop 1 motor isn't circular, it's linear. And the rotor is on the pod, which is propelled magnetically as it moves over the stator. Hyperloop One's unique technology uses magnetic levitation to guide and lift the pod off the track. Nearly all of the air inside the Hyperloop tube is removed using a series of vacuum pumps. This effectively creates our own sky inside the tube as if you are quietly flying at 200,000 feet above sea level. This reduces drag so only the smallest amount of electricity is needed to achieve extraordinary speeds and creates a more cost and energy efficient system than high-speed rail or airline transport. Hyperloop One will be automated by the most advanced systems in the world, allowing a safe and efficient journey that's never delayed or overbooked. Hyperloop is the first new form of public transportation. 
So I truncated the video so that we could get through everything. But take a look at this. Is this science fiction? When you see a video like that, you're like, well, that sounds really cool, and I would love to have that kind of transportation here in Britain or around the world, but how can we make that real? And the way we do that is with engineering, and that is kind of the purpose of engineering. And for all the doubters out there, you need to only take a look at the beginnings of flight. So it was only you know back in the late 1800s where people are like, it's going to be impossible to have heavier than air flying machines, right? People were familiar with blimps, which use helium, which is lighter than air. So it took the advent of flight um, with the concept of aerodynamic lift with the Wright brothers to actually create the mode of high-speed transportation that we use today, which essentially you know, has eliminated shift travel over the oceans and ships and shifted completely into travel with airplanes across oceans over long distances and high speeds. And airplanes, as you know, can go 500 miles an hour, which really does facilitate travel. You can also take airplanes, for example, between... Heathrow and here in Liverpool or out in Glasgow, but there's a certain amount of inefficiency associated with having to drive to the airport, check in with your bags, walk to the gate, taxi on the runway, and then finally take off. So there are other ways that we could travel which could be more efficient. And so any of you guys out there fans of the movie The Martian? And so the purpose of The Martian is that he was stuck in a really difficult situation, but fortunately he was an engineer, so he was able to science the shit out of it to be able to come up with a solution to his problem. And so we do have a problem in terms of transportation efficiency right now, and so that's where engineering comes in. And a wonderful quote that I love from Theodore von Karman, who was kind of the, the father of modern rocketry, is that science is about observing what's around us, and engineering is about creating that we would like to see, the world that we would ideally like to see. And that's the way you take science fiction concepts and turn them into science fact. And so how we do that for the purpose of a hyperloop transportation system is we use the fundamentals of electromagnetism. So we use that both to levitate the pod off of the track as well as to propel it forward electrically. And the benefit of that, of course, is that you're using power from the grid and that power can come from reusable resources, which is kind of the unique aspect of what it is that we're trying to do. But why do we need to do this? Because anybody who knows who takes transportation here within Britain, whether you're driving on the motorways or you're taking trains or high-speed trains or local trains like here in Mersey Rail, is that they're relatively slow, right, which means that you have to stop and start at multiple stations, and there's a tremendous amount of congestion. So, for example, when I was flying at Heathrow two days ago, I wasn't actually able to get on my Virgin train, ironically, since I work at Virgin. Um, but and the reason why I couldn't is because it was so full. It was already at capacity. I had to wait for the next train. So we know around the world, transportation sectors, the capacity of our systems is already maxed out, which means we need another way to transport people more efficiently and more quickly. And similarly on the roads, similarly in the ports, wherever you look, we have more people than our transportation systems can handle. And what that does is it costs us time, which is important to each of us, but it also costs money. And it does lead to a tremendous amount of waste, and it leads to a tremendous amount of congestion and also air pollution. If you take a look at you know, cities in India and in China, for example. That's a real large issue. And if you also think about it holistically, it's been over 100 years since the last new mode of transportation has been invented. So time is now ready for something new. And so in the 1990s, we had the IT revolution, which basically allows us to transfer information at the speed of light. It allows us to communicate with each other at the speed of light. We're ready for a transportation revolution. And so with the advent of autonomous systems, for example, self-driving cars, with the advent of new technologies to collect telemetry from vehicles, there's no reason why our mass transportation systems couldn't shift to an autonomous model, which allows them to be more efficient and more safe, and actually translate that efficiency as a lower cost to the consumer. So we do believe that the next mode of transportation is around the corner, um, and hopefully that will be the Hyperloop. And so when you're going to create a new form of transportation, you actually have to think about the end user, your customer. So when you think about mass transportation, the customer is the person ultimately buying the ticket, right? So if they're going to take a train uh, on a really um, high speed, they want it to be a train that they can afford. So you have to think about travel time, you have to think about cost, you have to think about passenger comfort. But when you're building a mass transportation system, your customer is also the government, whether it's a local government, a state government, a county government, or the overall European Union. So you have to take into account the rate regulatory aspects of your inserting this new transportation system. And so you start off with capacity, which is the number of people that need to travel per hour from point A to point B. And you also have to start with cost, which is how much does it cost to actually implement the new transportation system, and how much of that cost is going to be levied on the ultimate consumer, and how do you make it lower so that people will support it, both when it comes to the time when you elect local politicians and you want to install this new transportation system, which requires political will, as well as people being willing to you know, throw away their car keys and 
actually start writing a mass transportation system. And although I think here in Britain, you guys make use of your mass transportation uh, quite a bit, it's not like that in the US, for example, where mass transportation is not as extensive as you have here, because we have a relatively large man mass in comparison. But, um, so what do we really want to do here is that we want to give people back their time. And I call that breaking the time barrier. So the last mode of transportation, which I think was kind of new, was the Concorde, which was breaking the sound barrier. So now, with a system like the Hyperloop, you can actually go around in incredibly fast speeds. And the way you do that is because of the uniqueness of this technology. So the unique aspect of the Hyperloop is that it operates in a vacuum tube. What that means is that you're inside of a metallic tube, most likely, which is the one that we've built, and you remove remove the air. And once you remove the air, you essentially get around the aerodynamic drag problem. So if any of you are scientists or engineers in the audience, if you were to go down the motorway and you put your hand out the window, you feel this force buffeting on your arm. That's aerodynamic drag. And it turns out, as you increase in speed, that force goes up with the speed squared. And what does that mean? It means more energy. It means more instability associated with these large buffeting forces. So there's a way to get around that, and that is to remove the air from the system. So this is why the Hyperloop is actually more like a spacecraft. And then when it comes down to the efficiency in operating a system like a train, for example, or a bus or an airplane, there's the operating cost. So how do you lower the operating cost? You reduce wear and tear on the vehicle, you reduce wear and tear on the track, and then you also lower the energy cost, the amount of fuel that you have to expend. So with this type of technology, you can do all those things because the passenger pod is actually levitating off of the track, which means you don't have frictional wear and tear of wheels. Uh, the passenger pod is being electromagnetically propelled within a very uniform environment because it's essentially a vacuum. And so the traditional wear and tear that you get on open air transportation systems because of the environment, whether it be dust or wind or snow or rain, is automatically eliminated because you've created your own microclimate. So that's what's so unique about this technology is that not only is it more energy efficient um, because you're using direct electrical energy to power the vehicle, not only does it produce less CO2 and therefore address the climate change problem, but you can also go at incredibly fast speeds. And so the design speed that we're targeting is actually actually 1,000 kilometers per hour, roughly 700 miles an hour at the peak. And those, of course, you would only want to do that over very long distances. Over shorter distances, that's not necessary uh, because the time benefit isn't there unless you're going over really long distances. But this is the way that you get around, uh, the way you break the time barrier, and the way you do it in a more energy efficient means. And of course, the final thing that everybody always loves to ask me is, well, what about passenger comfort? So what's unique about a Hyperloop is because you're levitating and because you're inside of a pressurized vehicle, inside of a vacuum, all the traditional discomfort that you have with plane travel or even with rail travel of bumping around in turbulence is essentially gone. So it's a, it's a smooth ride. So you really do capture all of those elements. And so when you're going to do something which has never been done before, you have to be innovative, like the prior speaker had said. And so how do you do that? the startup environment. <laughs> so if those of you, I don't know if you've seen it or not, but there's a funny show called Silicon Valley, um, which is a show in the US, which is about you know, the environment that you have where a bunch of millennials get together and change the world. And so that's kind of what we're doing. We're not all millennials. I'm not a millennial, for example. But we're doing it in a non-traditional way. We're doing it with a small team of engineers in an open office environment where we can innovate and create on time scales, which are atypical for most you know, massive aerospace companies or transportation companies, for example. So this is actually what our company looks like. You can see our team is a mix of different age ranges, uh, but it is largely a much smaller company, a much younger company, and we're able to operate and innovate on a relatively fast time scale. The element of it, of course, is a maker space. We want to be able to make our own equipment. So you can see an example of a vacuum tube that we're building um, in our facility at Las Vegas. And the next is actually demonstrating the technology, which is where my NASA experience comes in, because before you fly any new technology in space, you have to demonstrate it first. So we started with an empty field out in Las Vegas, just to the northeast, and I know people from England love going to Las Vegas, so you actually can see this if you look it up on Google Maps. And then we shifted and we built a half kilometer system, an operational hyperloop, the first in the world. And we've demonstrated a peak speed here of 400 kilometers per hour, and as we build the track out even longer, we'll be able to get to faster speeds. But this is key, because once you demonstrate the technology, people feel comfortable with it and they want to proceed. We've demonstrated it with a pod, so this gives you the scale and the size of the type of vehicle that you would sit inside with the Hyperloop, up to 400 miles an hour. So I'll give you one more short video. All parties ready for tests? Firing in five, four, three, two, one, fire. So you can
can see we actually did it. It works. And so now the next thing is to implement it in countries around the world. And what you can think about this is you can turn cities into metro stops. So going between London, Liverpool, and Glasgow would be less than an hour between each of those stops, door to door, transportation time. So it's kind of shocking. So you can change your whole urban area to something else. And in the context of the United States, you can basically connect the whole country door to door in less than five hours. So in the case of the UK, probably less than about two and a half hours. So it's a pretty impressive way of doing things. So just to wrap it up, um, STEM and STEM education outreach is incredibly important to me. There's still only about 15 to 20 percent, at least in aerospace and computer science. And so I worked with a lady who was actually from the EU, Libby Jackson, and we put out a book that got released in the UK in November of last year. It's called Galaxy of Her Own here. And then we just released it in the US called Galaxy Girls. So if you have any daughters or sisters um, you'd like to buy them this book, it's really inspirational. I am in it um, towards what's happening in the future. And also for your local libraries and schools, I highly recommend it. Thank you.